Welcome back to another talk from Behavioral Health 2000. Today we start a new series, The Codes of Perception. In other words, can scientists elucidate the neuronal firing code that corresponds to recognition of objects in our environment? I was uh, inspired to do this talk by a paper that appeared just recently in the month of June or early July in Cell magazine by a group from Caltech led by Doris Zhao who has spent the last 10 or more years in identifying the neuronal code for face recognition in primates. Uh, so this paper here in slide number one has a very innocent title, The Code for Facial Identity in the Primate Brain, but it really makes a major discovery that may overturn our understanding of how the brain does visual processing, object recognition, and may feed back into the field of artificial intelligence, which has run into a dead end in its application of deep neuronal nets that hide a great deal of what's going on inside the black box of the equations that produce their results. So here then is the next slide and um, you can see the basic uh, strategy, namely uh, the group recorded from the monkey brain, macaque monkeys, from two different brain areas. Uh, these are the, in the inferior temporal cortex. These areas have been identified through MRI scanning previously. And as it turns out, there are six interconnected face place fields that talk to each other and generate the decoding of faces. Here you can see that the monkey is looking at a human face. And the group was able, by analyzing the neuronal firing pattern of the different face areas, and by some clever mathematics and statistics, to discover their finding that we will discuss in this paper. Now here I want to show you a video of one of these little macaque monkeys, uh, a uh, basically newborn toddler macaque mon monkey, who is very interested in looking at the face of his uh, human experimenter and observer. And you may agree with me that there is eye-to-eye -eye contact and an attempt by the monkey to relate to uh, the human counterpart and mimic some of his facial expression, especially the movement of the mouth. So I'll let you watch this brief video, which we overlay with a piece of music, the first time I ever saw your face, because faces is what we deal with all the time. Faces are perhaps the most important objects that we ever look at. Faces contain incredible amounts of information regarding our social connections, our mood, decoding attitudes, intentions, and many other things, uh, especially emotions. And our face, of course, is there to display emotions as well. So here the monkey is clearly intrigued and uh, enamored by the uh, human counterpart and then let you see this brief video. In chimps and humans, we have 23 different facial muscles. They're becoming more and more flexible. I mentioned before that the snout region is increasingly reduced in primates. So you have some simpler primates where there's still a strong snout, which is limiting the ability of the face to move. Uh, but the more complex the primate is getting, the more and more flexible these muscles become, and the more expressive the faces become. So the face is not, now becomes richer and richer with social signals that you can read out. And in rhesus monkeys, which are shown here, you have a fixed set of facial expressions that, again, uh, for a system that can analyze these, uh, it's very important information about the uh, emotional state of another animal. Primates are also very interested in faces. I very much like to show this movie. The first time ever I saw The sun 
and the moon and the stars were the gifts you gave. Welcome back from the video. I hope you enjoyed the little macaque um, monkey who's really very, very cute. Now here is another example of a face, a human face, but not a real one, but rather created by an artist. In this case, Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa, which hangs in the Louvre in Paris, of course. Now, many people have commented on this face, it, uh, the mysterious smile of the Mona Lisa, and um, it uh, evokes uh, emotional responses in people who flock to this painting in the Louvre. Uh, if they want to see any painting at all in Paris, this is the one that people want to see. And I play you a little piece of music by Mozart, which uh, highlights the emotional impact of seeing your beloved for the first time. Okay, welcome back from our brief excursion into the world of art and Mozart, which was to highlight the tremendous importance of faces for our emotional connections, for our social fabric, and many other aspects as well. Let's step back a little bit and reflect on what are the signals that we are retrieving from our environment. In the case of vision, what we retrieve, of course, is light. So we can see that light enters here, the retina in the back of the eye. The retina is constructed in a very interesting way. No human engineer would set it up this way because the light has to travel through a number of cell layers first before it arrives at the so-called photoreceptors, which come in two varieties, the cones and the rods, Cones being dedicated to color vision and rods being monochromatic. So here then is the pathway. The rods capture the light. Um, the impulse is now in digital form. Firing patterns are generated in the bipolar cells going to the ganglion cells still within the retina. There's a great deal of processing going on here in the retina already. The signal is then transferred into the brain and winds up in the visual cortex, as we will soon learn. Now, what happens at the molecular level is quite stunning. So here's a description of the capture of light. Now, light consists of photons, and photons are either described as waves or as packets of energy. And in quantum mechanics, there's an equation that the Planck constant times the frequency is the uh, energy packet uh, that is transferred. So energy is received by our retina in packets or light waves and is then captured by a molecule which is able to flip its appearance by twisting the side chain here and here, upside down and backwards, and that captures the energy contained in the photon and sets a process in motion that uh, transduces the energy into the firing of nerve cells. 
So now the capture of the photon has been encoded in the firing pattern of neurons. And these firing patterns are faithfully transduced into the visual cortices, which are uh, retinotopic. In other words, the orientation, the spatial orientation in the retina is preserved in the visual cortex here, labeled B1, V2, V3. So progressively, the signal is then worked up and feed forwarded into higher cortical areas and eventually winds up in that area which we will discuss today, namely the inferior temporal cortex. And here it is in green. Now you see there are two pathways outlined here, namely the ventral visual stream that is dedicated to decoding what is it that I see, the what is it pathway, and another dorsal stream pathway in the parietal lobe dedicated to decoding where is it in the environment. So we won't bother today with the dorsal stream and con concentrate on the ventral stream in the inferior temporal lobe. That's where face recognition presumably takes place. Now a little more of the anatomy. Here's a human brain and you can see the temporal lobe here, the entire structure which contains several intriguing regions. One is the fusiform face area right here. The inferior temporal lobe in the back here contains the face recognition microchip. Here is the auditory cortex and here is Wernicke's area. That area which is affected in certain types of aphasia where patients can talk, produce speech sounds and words, but often the speech is nonsensical and uh, non-grammatical and difficult to decode. So this is where the area is located and here are some more annotated brain regions. You can see here Wernicke's area of importance to neurologists and psychiatrists. Here is the primary auditory, uh, auditory cortex and here is the fusiform face area. Now moving on to the connections that go from the face recognition areas to the rest of the brain. And you can see that the signal is transferred to the amygdala. The amygdala, as we have discussed in many other talks, is that region that decides whether something is scary or non-threatening and perhaps even positive. It is transferred to the insula, a brain region that decodes signals from the body, from our body interior, dealing with emotions such as disgust or certain pleasures, uh, enjoying food, etc. And here is the striatum, which of course contains dopaminergic cells of the reward system. So is the uh, sight I'm seeing interesting and pleasant? Do I want to approach it? Will I be motivated to approach and to interact with the image that I have seen? So you can see that decoding is not just uh, identifying a face, but linking the face to different aspects of emotion, uh, motivation, and other um, limbic processes that give meaning to the decoded image. There are situations in which um, a strategically located stroke has disrupted the connection of the face area, for example, to limbic structures and so-called capgrass syndrome. Now these are patients who come home someday and say, well, I know she looks just like my wife, but I know she is not. She is an imposter. There's something wrong with her. Something is just not quite right. And uh, this can be a quite dangerous uh, situation in, in terms of forensic psychiatry because you would be very upset if somebody was in your house uh, being an imposter of somebody close to you. And um, some tragic cases have occurred of homicide in that particular situation. So, face recognition does not stop with identifying a face, 
but plugs deep into limbic structures that give meaning and purpose to the recognized face. So here then is how the experiment was done, roughly. You see here the monkey with the uh, various face areas in the inferior temporal lobe. And the monkey was put into an MRI scanner. It was reinforced for fixating onto a target in the middle of the visual field by giving small amounts of juice intermittently. The monkeys love their juice and will focus their attention, their visual attention, on a target such as this one here, and then be exposed to a human face, giving the researchers the opportunity to record the activity of neuronal assemblies or single cells in this monkey brain. So here again is the form phase area, and here are some of the other areas that are important in the human brain. Here is the dorsal frontal cortex, um, the cingulate that has to do with error detection, and uh, the ventromedial frontal cortex that has to do with salience, what is important to me and why. Now in the next slide, we see the stimuli that were shown to the monkeys. So we have faces here, of course, of various kinds and all kinds of unrelated stimuli. And the task was then to determine which cells in these uh, inferior temporal regions respond to the perception of faces. And you can see here the firing pattern of certain cells but only if and when a face appeared uh, in the retina of the monkey and in the inferior temporal cortex. So here then is a single cell that was exposed to a host of different faces and it starts firing very actively whenever a face image appeared but not when other images were shown. For example, bodies, fruits, gadgets, hands, and so on and so forth. So only faces here showed you the increased firing pattern. So this is the methodology that this group used to locate a number of cells that only respond to faces. Now, these, fa these uh, face uh, responsive uh, cells are not only in one face area but in several. And as it turns out, two strategic ones are important to differentiate, namely the medial cells and the anterior cell group, uh, which will make a reappearance later in the talk. And you can see that the firing pattern, of course, is consistent with being highly specialized for faces, uh, yielding a face selective index that shows how specific are these cells for faces. As you can see, there is some firing going on here, but the index, of course, strongly increases in certain cells, making them highly specialized for faces. So here then is how the experiment, experiment continued. Namely, the recording was done from a medial as well as from an anterior face cell area in an attempt to see what the hierarchy is. It turns out the hierarchy is processing goes from the visual cortex first to the medial and then to the anterior face cell. So somewhere in there, the mathematics and the coding takes place that yields uh, face cells able to identify a specific face. So here I'll show you a brief video clip uh, from Dr. Zhao's lab where she describes the discovery of these face patches. This is a very difficult problem to tackle experimentally because the brain contains so many neurons, over 100 billion, and we can only record from a few neurons at a time. And furthermore, there's an infinite number of possible objects, and we have little idea for any particular neuron which of these objects it's coding. To understand the brain's language for objects, it seemed like we would need some incredible stroke of luck, like a Rosetta Stone with the neural code for objects inscribed upon it. 
Um, from stroke patients who have problems recognizing complex objects, we knew that the processes for object recognition would be found in a specific part of the brain called inferior temporal cortex. And I was working closely together with a fellow postdoc, Vinrich Freiwald. And we were presenting images from different object categories to a monkey inside an fMRI scanner. And as David Van Essen explained this morning, fMRI is a technique that lets you measure blood flow across the entire brain. So while the monkey was looking at these different object categories, including gadgets, uh, fruits, and faces, we measured blood flow across the brain. And we found six specific regions that lit up to faces. So the blood flow to one of these regions, when the monkey was looking at this sequence of object categories, was much stronger to the faces than to the non-face objects. And we call these regions face patches. Okay. So um, fMRI is a relatively coarse and indirect measure of neural activity. So then we used an electrode to measure the responses of individual neurons in this region. And we used an electrode with a very fine tip that let us listen to the electrical signals from a single neuron. And when we advanced the tip, we could listen to a neighboring different neuron. And now I want to show you a movie of what we heard on our very first day of recording from this face patch. So you're going to see what the monkey saw, and you'll also hear these clicks, which represent the electrical signals generated by this single neuron. So here's the very first cell. So I hope you notice the cell is responding to a very specific subset of stimuli. <laughs> Here's the next cell. Next cell. Do you notice a pattern? <laughs> All right, so around cell four, we noticed a pattern. It seemed like every cell we encountered responded more to the faces than to other objects. And to a clock occasionally. <laughs> So we were very excited after hearing these Welcome back. You have just seen the video, the video of Dr. Zhao describing the discovery of face cell patches. So in, in order to investigate these further, the group now uh, generated parameterized realistic face stimuli using the so-called active appearance model. Now that's a mouthful, and I will try to break it down a little bit for you. So in the next slide, you can see, in the next video, you can see how you can morph a face that has been dotted with specific markers around the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and distort the shape of the face in very specific ways. So here it is. You can see we can morph the face and we can use the mathematics in such a way to create an appearance where the individualized shape of the face has been normalized against an average face of, for example, 200 faces, such that there is a kind of original face and you can then determine the distance of these various face parameters that the individual face might have from the parameters obtained from an average face. And that is important later in the mathematics and the model building that Dr. Zahl's group utilized. Now, there is another problem, and that is faces don't only look at you straight, but they can look at you sideways uh, from different angles under different lighting conditions. So I show you a brief video from Dr. Freiwald's uh, talk that he recently gave at MIT. Now, Dr. Freiwald and Dr. Zahl used to be collaborators in this particular field, and he explained something called invariance under transformation. And he uses uh, the picture of Don Corleone from the Godfather movies, 
and he will explain to you what invariance and their transformation is. Okay, so social perception, well, can start with faces, but faces are uh, the most uh, important visual source of social information. We get gender and age, personal identity, even things like perceived trustworthiness or attractiveness from just a very brief look at the face. And then, then these dynamical signals like mood and uh, overdirection of attention that we also get from the face. So how does this all work? So uh, Jim was already explaining some of the challenges uh, of face of object recognition to you. And so here are some of the challenges. So first of all, if a social scene like this one here, lighting conditions can sometimes be non-optimal. Um, and uh, so the first thing for you to analyze the, the, the spatial signals which are in the scene is to localize where the faces are. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we understand about the neural mechanisms of that. Then once you know where the faces are, you actually want to analyze them further. You want, want to know like who these individuals are. And I just realized that the images that I had from this, which are of course also taken from The Godfather, might not be the best, but who, uh, wh where's the other picture of this individual here in, in this display of these five faces? Upper right. Um, and then there's another individual, uh, this is Don Corleone, and that, uh, uh, it's another person down here with two different directions. And then if the light lets me down a little bit more, you could see this better. Uh, the cool thing is that we have a way of relating these two pictures to each other, knowing that they're from the same person. Even though physically on a pixel by pixel basis, these two actually are much more similar to each other. And so we'd like to figure out like, how the brain is doing that, achieving object recognition, in this case face recognition, in a manner that's invariant uh, to transformations that are not intrinsic to, to the object. Welcome back from uh, Dr. Freiwald's talk and uh, from Don Corleone and The Godfather. Now back to Dr. Zhao, who will now describe for you the um, effect of cartoon faces that can be edited and adjusted for many different parameters, such as, for example, the presence of hair. And here's a okay, welcome back from the presence of hair. And here is another movie where Dr. Zhao describes the iris detection uh, by monkey brain in cartoon faces. Here's a different cell that's detecting the presence of irises. So now, looking at the anterior face area, here are cells that now respond to a single individual face with high reliability, and furthermore, it doesn't really matter the angle of the face or where the patient, the person is looking. And so here is a brief uh, video clip from Dr. Zhao's talk that it illustrates this. The, you can hear the firing pattern of cells that respond only to one face out of several that are shown in this brief video clip. Welcome back from the video from Dr. Zhao. And now let's dig a little into how this data is processed. So we know that when uh, the image of the face hits the retina, uh, the image is converted into electrical signals. They pass through a number of neurons and are processed at each stage in certain ways. So as a result, by the time the image arrives in the inferior temporal lobe, it's really a code, a digital code, that needs to be decoded. So uh, the idea then is there should be something like an average face, kind of like the origin of all faces. And the brain then measures the deviation of parameters of the individual face from this 
average phase that you can create by uh, statistical measures by uh, combining many parameters as outlined above. So each, each phase cell uh, reads the combined vector of a number of dimensions then that have been encoded in the higher areas of the hierarchy. Now, the anterior phase cells are the final output stage of the inferior temporal uh, phase processing. In particular, there is a population of sparse cells that has been found in AM, which appears to encode exemplars for a specific individual. But we know now that is not so. Rather, there is a connectivity between different areas in the inferior temporal cortex space uh, phase areas that together as an assembly allow a phase cell in the anterior phase region to respond to individual cell uh, individual phases. So here then is a outline as to how this is done. You can see there are many dots applied to the image of this lady. These are done by hand. Here are the dots by themselves and you can now morph these dots in such a way that you minimize the distance from an average face image. So you can collect uh, hundreds or thousands of faces, average them out, and then determine the distance that these different points have in this particular lady from the average normalized face. And you can see here here is the shape, so-called shape-free face. You can still recognize her. It's her, but there is a reduction in the individuality that is done by this method. So this is the so-called uh, method, the uh, shape-free presentation of a face. So you can now um, create other parameters such as texture, um, the reflectivity, the color of the skin and other items like this that give you a appearance free face. So just as we normalize for shape free, we can also normalize for appearance free. Now the purpose of this is to allow a computation that will identify individual faces down the road invariant under transformation. What happens is mathematically the uh, data winds up to present a face in a 50-dimensional space, uh, putting all these parameters in, but each space and each equation is precisely defined. Uh, not as I will show you later in artificial intelligence, where we don't know what's going on in the multiple neuronal layers of the neuronal network in AI. So a 50-dimensional space, phase space, is obtained and you can reconstruct the face from the parameters in this 50D space after obtaining the recording from the monkey. And here you can see the reconstruction of the original face. And you will agree that there's a very good correspondence. Here again is a summary of how this is done. So we have the shape analysis, we get a shape-free appearance, and you can re reconstruct the face thereafter. Now, we can also do principal component analysis. Principal, principal component analysis is a technique to look at the variance. Where is the largest variation from a standard mean face? that we need to take into consideration. Uh, this group uh, focused on 25 principal components that can be plugged into the face space and then used to reconstruct faces, as you can see here. Here are different standard deviations to either side of an average face, and that gives you the tools and the mathematics to recover the individual phase from the firing patterns of the neurons. Here again you can see original and reconstruction and other examples. Next slide shows um, the um, phase done in cartoons 
And the next slide shows you the extensive uh, series of analysis that the group has done by looking at various dimensions of hair and uh, irises here. And all these were encoded in this 50-dimensional space to get a handle on the variability of faces. And you can see here that uh, some cells then specialize, for example, here in irises and here in hair. So these are all parameters that the face areas decode before the final assembly, the final computation reaches the anterior face region where faces then can be recognized and identified. So here are some more um, examples of this, how these different dimensions are extracted. And here is the firing pattern of individual cells that respond to the tuning of these different parameters. For example, here the height of the feature assembly gives a very uh, sharp tuning curve in this particular neuron. Here is the size of the iris that some neurons are extremely sensitive to. Here is the inter-eye distance. And these tuning curves are largely linear. So as opposed to some of the equations in AI, which are highly nonlinear, non these equations are simple, stupid linear transformations, which make the mathematics much more um, straightforward and allow for a complete reconstruction of the image without invoking multiple neuronal layers and many, many weights assigned to the computations within these layers that create the appearance of a black box where we don't know how the AI program did its business. So then here is the image of an assembly line. So you start here in the earlier regions and assemble the image progressively as you wind up in AM where you can finally uh, record cells that re appear to respond only to one specific face. But it didn't do it alone. It did it with all the workers in the assembly line together. In the next slide um, you can see another summary here. So the data reveal a remarkably simple code for facial identity in these face patches ML and A1 and these can be used to precisely decode realistic face images from population responses of cells and accurately predict neuronal firing. So one prediction of this model is that each cell should have a linear null space uh, orthogonal to the preferred axis. In other words, where all faces elicit the same response and only specific faces, individual faces, will vary from that response. So here is the final summary. Facial identity then is encoded via a remarkable simple neural code that relies on the ability of neurons to distinguish facial features along specific axes in face space, disavowing the long-standing assumption that single face cells encode individual faces. There is no grandmother cells. Uh, there is no Don Corleone cell. Rather, it's done by the composition of a multidimensional space in the inferior temporal cortex. And here is a summary of what they did. You've seen this slide at the beginning of the talk. And finally, let's contrast this with artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence relies on neural nets, neural networks, that are fed examples. For example, here the network is supposed to learn what a volcano looks like. And you have an input layer here, initially, and multiple hidden layers in which a number of computations take place, such as the detection of edges, detection of colors, and eventually by assigning different values to, to these nodes here that can be constantly adjusted, hopefully the output then is, after training, always identifying a, a volcano correctly. That is the basic idea of AI networks. 
Now it gets pretty hairy because here you see a deep neuronal network and you can see that every node is connected to every other node and all these nodes contain equations that have certain weights to their um, variables attached and after the computation is done you don't know what these weights were. There is a black box phenomenon going on here. You are presented with a result, but you don't really know exactly how it was achieved. And that is one of the conundrums right now in artificial intelligence, that you need many training examples, maybe thousands and thousands of images, to train um, a neuronal net to identify a cat. Cats were the first um, objects identified by um, feeding uh, YouTube videos into an AI network. And there are many, many YouTube videos with cats. The program wasn't really told to identify cats, but cats were such a predominant um, presentation in YouTube that the program eventually pulled out cats, was able to identify all cat-like images in different uh, areas, in different uh, shades, different angles, and so forth. But the mathematics and the details got lost here in the deep neuronal network, which is a black box. So what this paper by Dr. Zhao then indicates is that this pessimism that is in AI may be able to be undone because the visual processing of faces is a counterexample by recording from neurons at the highest stage of the visual system, we can see that there is no black box. Rather, that there is a higher dimensional space uh, which encodes uh, linear uh, equations that can be uh, resolved and can be used to reconstruct the original image. And Dr. Zal's bet is that this is true throughout the brain and perhaps for all objects that the brain recognizes. So this then may be a breakthrough not only in um, how the brain decodes visual information but also may give feedback to the AI community as to how perhaps to adjust their methodology to get closer to how the brain does its neuronal detective work. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you soon again for another talk from Behavioral Health 2000.